Hey, happy uh, third Sunday of Advent. Hope that you are engaging the Advent season and working your way through it with a great hope and a great peace that we've talked about the first two weeks. Next week, uh, last Sunday of Advent, we're going to talk together about uh, love. Uh, then Christmas Eve, as Pastor Bignall just said, uh, 4 o'clock and 10 o'clock if you're part of our online, Perry is part of our online community and you're not able to make it to a Christmas Eve gathering in your uh, city, we would love for you to join us online, 4 o'clock or 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, uh, to be a part of that. And then just kind of a heads up for where we're going in the days ahead. Uh, two weeks from today, the 29th of December, that Sunday between uh, Christmas and New Year's, uh, I'm going to be doing a teaching uh, that I'm calling follow through. Uh, we started the year talking about John the baptizer, it's been nine weeks on his life, saying we want this year to be 2013 to be greater spiritual year than we've ever experienced in all of our life. And all of us started off with good intentions and I wonder how we finished the year. Was it really a greater year? If follow through doesn't uh, grab your attention, here, here's the, uh, here's the uh, uh, sermon and the sentence for that Sunday, two weeks from today. Uh, you're one decision away from stupid. Uh, and I'm one decision away from stupid as well. We're going to be talking about what that decision is and how we, how we handle it and how we did with that. So that's, that's uh, the 29th. And then starting uh, the first Sunday of January, I'm doing a new teaching series that I've uh, just called uh, Finding Everland, Finding and Following God's Plan for My Life. And we're going to talk three Sundays about whoever, whenever, and, and, and whatever. Finding Everland, God's Finding and Following God's Plan for My Life. So this uh, third Sunday of Advent, uh, any, any guesses as we get into the third Sunday of Advent, what do you think is the most uh, published, uh, produced, and performed Christmas carol of all time? Anybody? Silent Night, that's a good answer. I heard another one. Joy to the world, that's exactly right, joy to the world. Now, uh, you wonder how many, how come people have this amount of time to figure this stuff out, but, but they believe that uh, sometime in the late 20th century, late 1990s, and some of the things I've read, most of the people that kind of study this, and again, I wonder where they get their time, but uh, they, they think that it was with Mariah Carey's album that included Joy to the World on it, that, it, that Joy to the World became the most uh, published performed and produced Christmas carol of all time. It was written originally in 1719 by a guy named Isaac Watts. You might not know much, much about Isaac Watts, but, but uh, if, you, if you're familiar with him, the great hymns of the faith, uh, Isaac Watts was one of the most prolific hymn writers of all time, but he really, he wrote poetry. Isaac Watts was born and he had a, had a sickness and never really overcame it. And by the time of fifth, he was 15, he, he already had this uh, uncanny ability to write poetry. And he, he showed up at church one Sunday and after church was over, he just kind of looked at his parents and like, the music here is awful. I don't want to come back if this is the music, and I can never invite a friend here if the, if the music was this bad. And his dad's like, well, don't tell me. Go tell the preacher. So this 15-year-old walked right up to the preacher and said, the music here is terrible. I never want to come back if this is the music we have, and I never, never could invite a friend to come hear this kind of music. And the preacher looked at him and says, come talk to me when you got something better. I love that preacher. <laughs> Sunday night, he came back with something better. He had written a poem and he had set it to music. And he began doing that weekly based on what the pastor was preaching. He would take mainly things out of the scriptures and he would, he would, he would rewrite them with poetry and he would set them to music. And in 1719, he, he, got, he sat down and he wrote eight verses of what we call joy to the world. You thought it only had four. The first four have totally disappeared from any hymn book, from any carol uh, that you ever sing. We only sing now the last four verses. And by the way, the music, the lyrics, the poem was written in 1719. The, the lyrics, uh, the music was added in about 1836, and it was a popular bar song. Took these lyrics that this guy had written and set it to the music of a popular bar song, and like everybody wants to go to church when you're singing the popular bar songs. And so it was kind of what Isaac Watts had in mind. But did you know that Joy to the World was never written to be a Christmas song? It was never written, it was not Isaac Watts' intention to draw attention to the birth of Jesus, to the first coming of Jesus. It was his intention to draw attention to the second coming of Jesus. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her. When Jesus came as the first time, he did not come as a king. 
Joy to the world, the Savior. When Jesus came the first time, he did not come and reign. He will come as the king and he will come to reign in his second coming. If you read the first four verses of the poem, the original poem, you would have no doubt that the song was written to talk about the second coming of Jesus. But we've taken it and it has now become the most uh, performed and published and produced Christmas carol of all time. And I I just have this hunch that if we're not careful that that we miss out on the meaning of of Christmas. And if we're not careful, the mystery of of Jesus' birth and the joy that he came to give and the choice that you and I have to make every single day. We join with the psalmist, Psalm 118, 24. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. The choice that we have to make over 250 times in the scriptures, the command to rejoice is given. I'm just kind of afraid that if if the story of Jesus, this old, old story of Jesus, just becomes a story like Rudolph or Frosty or Santa, just one of the other stories that we tell at Christmas, we'll really miss the joy that Jesus came to give us. Well, how can we tap into that joy? How can it not just be a a Christmas carol? How can it really be the joy? Luke chapter 2, beginning to read in verse 8. Luke chapter 2, beginning to read in verse 8. Maybe you brought a Bible with you. Maybe you have it on a mobile device. Maybe you have it old-fashioned paper and ink. Maybe you don't have a Bible of your very own. If you don't have a Bible of your very own today, would you stop by our Connect desk? We'd love to give you a copy of God's Word as your very own, free of charge. If you'd rather have it as a mobile uh, download, we'd be happy to share with you the, the, the version that we, uh, the, the app that we recommend, free of charge to you, that you can get the God's Word downloaded onto your tablet or your phone. And so it's just important that you have a copy of God's Word so it doesn't just become just an old, old story, but it becomes the, the story that you love. So Luke chapter 2, verse 8 And there were shepherds living out in their fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And the angel appears and says, do not be afraid. And he says, I don't want you to just tap into the external circumstances that are around you. And that's the first thing we need to understand is that joy is not happiness. Happiness by its very definition, if you look at the word and you look at the root word hap, hap means circumstances or setting. And so so much of the time our happiness is dependent on our circumstances, right? If everything goes exactly the way I want it to go, I'll be happy. If that bill gets paid on time, I'll be happy. If the job promotion comes through, I'll be happy be happy. If the preacher's done by 12, I'll be, I'll be happy, right? Dependent on the external circumstances. But joy is not dependent on external circumstances. Joy, the angels are going to proclaim, that God offers is, is an internal and an eternal relationship with the Almighty God. Not contingent on our external circumstances. Our pursuit of happiness is, is contingent on what's taking place around us externally. And the angel says, do not be afraid. I've got great news and it has nothing to do with the circumstances that are going on right now. It's something deeper. And the angels or the shepherds are like, why would God want to speak to us? Nobody talks to us. We're the lowliest of the low. We're the, we're the outcasts of society. We, we can't even give testimony in a court of law because people say, well, we can't believe you. You're just a shepherd. And God's angels come and they speak this good news of great joy. And it's fascinating to me that right here in this angelic announcement is something we find nowhere else in the scriptures. Now we find the term Savior, we find the term Messiah, we find the term Lord all throughout the scriptures prophesied hundreds of years in advance of Jesus. Proclaimed while Jesus is walking the planet. Written about Jesus uh, hundreds of years after, you know, 60, 70, 80, 90 years after Jesus ascends into heaven. That he's the the Savior, that he was Messiah, that he was the Lord. But right here in this angelic announcement, it's the only place in all of the scriptures where we find it all put together. I bring you good news of great joy which will be for all the people. Today in the town of David has been born a Savior. He's the Messiah, the Lord. And I think when we come to understand this internal and eternal relationship that we have with Jesus as Savior, Messiah, and Lord, we begin to to understand how we can truly have joy. And so I want to talk to you about those three names, Savior, Messiah, and Lord. He will be a Savior. What what does it mean when we're Savior? Next next to the word Savior, I I just encourage you to write the word hopeless. I encourage you to write the word hopeless. Hopeless. On your teaching outline, I put it this way. We rejoice in the birth of Jesus when we come to grips with how hopeless we are in the grip of sin. When I begin to wrestle with and understand how hopeless I am in the grips of sin, I can rejoice 
that Jesus came to be my savior. That sin has such a grasp on me, it has such a grip on me that I, I'm hopeless. I can't get out of it on my own. Jesus, Jesus some, of, some of us just think, well, I'm so much caught in sin that I'll just try harder. But Jesus didn't come to say try harder. Jesus came to say, you are hopelessly caught in the grip of sin. And I just wanna know, have you, have you come to the reality of, of how desperately trapped in the grasp of sin you were before Jesus came to the planet. Isaiah chapter six, if you brought a Bible with you. Isaiah chapter six, keep your finger in Luke chapter two. We'll go back there in just a minute. But Isaiah chapter six, this prophet named Isaiah has a, has a vision. He, he's gonna be the prophet that uh, hundreds of years before Jesus says, uh, you'll call his name wonderful counselor, everlasting God, prince of peace. So that, that's the one who's coming. He's, he's gonna be the one, Isaiah 53, who gives us the, the prophecy of, of Jesus as the suffering servant, that there was nothing in his appearance that should attract us to him, who, who, who kept his mouth silent like a, like a sheep that goes before his shearers. He's going to give us that prophecy of Jesus' death. But Isaiah has this vision of God, and it says this, in the year that King Uzziah died, verse 1, I saw the Lord seated on a throne high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were seraphs angels of some kind, and they each had six wings. With two wings they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying around. And they were calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. And I cried, woe is me, for I am a sinful man of unclean lips, and I live among a people, a sinful people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King the Lord Almighty. Isaiah says, when I saw God, when I got just a vision of who he is, the only thing I could conclude was, I'm a sinner. Woe is me. I am hopeless. I've got a problem. My sin does not allow me into the presence of this holy God. There are angels who are so amazed by who he is. With six wings, two other wings they use just to cover their face because they're afraid to even look at him. Now, if these angels are afraid to, to look at him, who am I? I? I'm a sinner, and evidently Isaiah struggled with some kind of filthy mouth. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. He said, I live, I'm a, I live much a group of people that are, that are unclean as well, and so I, I'm, I'm guilty by choice, and I'm guilty by association. In front of the holy God, he says, I am a sinner. And one of the reasons we we don't rejoice is because we've forgotten how desperately we, hopeless we were in the grips of sin. And that God knew that and he sent Jesus a good news of great joy. By the way, if there, let me say this, before it can be good news, there has to be bad news. And the bad news is, yes, you're a sinner. And the bad news is, yes, because of your sin, you're separated from a holy God. The bad news is you don't deserve to be in his presence. The bad news is you're going to spend eternity separated from him. But the good news is Jesus came to be the Savior. And I can rejoice if, if I grab a hold. It's not about my external circumstances. And it's not about the sins of my past. Because Jesus came as a Savior to forgive my past. And it's amazing. I just want to know today, have you ever rejoiced over the fact that Jesus came because you were hopeless? Hopelessly caught in the grip of sin. Don't compare yourself to anybody else. Just you. You between you and God. If you catch a glimpse of who God is, the only conclusion you can reach is I'm a sinner. And the scripture says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The scripture says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. But the good news is that Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. John 3.17 you know John 3.16, but I'd really encourage you to memorize 3.17 as well. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Rejoice, he's your savior. Then it says he's the Messiah. Some of your translations you're reading along didn't say Messiah, it said Christ. Christ is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. It means the anointed one. It means the one with oil on its head, the one who, who's going to come to, to rule and to reign. And he says, here's the Messiah. Next to Messiah, I'd, I'd encourage, next to Savior, you write, wrote hopeless. Next to Messiah, I'd encourage you to write helpless. I'd encourage you to write helpless. And we can rejoice in the birth of Jesus when we come, when we believe that God came to rescue us in the mystery 
of Jesus. God came to us. He came to save us from our past. He came to rescue us in, in this moment, in the mystery of Jesus. He's the Messiah. Uh, here's a working definition of Messiah that I'd, I'd like for you to have. Messiah is the one who will do something about it. The one who will do something about it. Now, the it's going to be different for each of us. But he's the one who will do something about it. If you have your Bible, turn to Psalm 57. Psalm 57. I want you to see the picture that's painted for the one who understands they need God to do something about it. In this case, his name is David. And his it is he's on the run for his life. There's a king named Saul, but David has been anointed the next king of Israel, and Saul found out Saul's trying to kill him, and David's on the run for his life. And David's trying to figure this out. Psalm 57, before we can read verse 1, we've got to read the little introduction. It says, this is for the director of music to the tune of uh, Do Not Destroy. It's a psalm of David, a miktam. Then it gives us the historical background. When he fled from Saul into the cave. Get the picture. David writes this from inside a cave. Uh, he's, he's gone into the, through the hole that's the only entrance into the cave. There's darkness and despair all around him. He's on the run for his life. He had the ability and had the opportunity even to kill Saul. And he said, I can't do it because who am I to kill God's anointed? God, I, I, I can't do this. Uh, uh, the person who understands that Jesus is the Messiah needs, that knows they, they, they need God to do something about it. And they understand they can't do anything about it themselves. God, I don't have a solution to this problem. I don't have a solution to this. So look what David does. It says this, Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. God, what's going on in my life right now is disastrous. I can't think of anything worse. There's somebody that wants to kill me. The only place I can come for safety is into a, into a cave. There's darkness and despair and, and disaster all around me, God. And I'm crying out, God, do something about it. And the Messiah is the one who will do something about it. And I want to ask you again today, what's your it? What is it that you need to do something, God to do something about? What, what, what is it the place that brings you to the place of darkness and despair and distress? And, and, and best you can tell from your perspective, everything around you is just, just disaster. This prayer, have mercy on me, God, that's the word mercy on me, God. God is the one who rescues us. It, it occurs uh, 68 times in the Old Testament. This prayer, have mercy on me, God. 41 times that it's used, the, the exact phrase that David used, have mercy on me, God. And I want to know what's the name of God that he uses here. It's not the holy uh, name of God, the one that I will be known by what I do, Yahweh. No, it's, it's the name Elohim. It's the Hebrew word Elohim. What, what's Elohim mean? Well, sometimes it helps us when we try to understand uh, what something means in Scripture to ask ourselves the question, where does this occur for the first time in the Scriptures? And this occurs for the first time in scriptures, the name Elohim, all the way back in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, Elohim, God, what's the next word? Created. David appeals to the creator of the cosmos. David appeals to the one who has the, the cosmos in his control. He says, creator of the universe, have mercy on me. I can't do anything about it, but you can. God, I need you. And it reminds us of the picture of Genesis 1, that when, when God began to create, everything was darkness. And I think that's one of the reasons David goes back to, to that name used in Genesis 1, because the worth, world at that point was, was without uh, light before God had created it. And, and so there's darkness, and what God does is he brings light into dark situations. He, he reveals what, what God does is he speaks uh, beauty into the midst of chaos. I love the one translation that talks about the, the world in existence of the spirit of God hovered over the wild and the waste. I, I love that. And I think that's what David's experiencing right now. My world feels wild and out of control, and it's, it's waste, and it's just going to be a disaster. God, do something about it. And I want to ask you again, what's your it? H how do you need God to act on your behalf? A couple of pictures I'd like for you to get in your head, and, and one of them is uh, Christmas presents that are under your tree. Maybe, maybe you live in a house like mine where there are no presents under the tree yet. And that's my fault for two reasons. Number one, I have been known to possess a very special skill of unwrapping and rewrapping presents without being noticed. Uh, if you'd like some insight, I'm happy to give a lesson. 
And so I've been known to do that in the past. So they don't want to put presents under the tree because they're afraid I can't wait. But the other thing is I'm, I'm just as bad at giving gifts. When I put thought into a gift and I think it's a great gift, I don't want anybody to have to wait till Christmas morning. And so I put something under the, under the tree. It's like, let them open it now. Autumn, let the girls open it now. Let them. No, you know, Christmas morning, that's when we, you know, if we're good, we'll open one on Christmas Eve and that kind of stuff. But everything, I, I just can't wait. But, but so maybe there aren't gifts under your tree yet because there aren't gifts under our tree. But maybe the gifts as they start to appear. I want you to look at every box. And when you look at every box, here's what I want you to say. That box is too small. Number one, that box is too small to hold the amount of mercy that I need. There are a whole bunch of things in my life where I need God to do something about it. And I'm going to have to ask and ask and ask and ask. That box is too small. But that box is also too small to hold the amount of mercy that God has to give. That box is too small. You see, most of the time I miss out on joy because I haven't, I haven't understood how the, the, the grips of sin that I'm in, I haven't understood my condition. But secondly, I, don't, I miss out on joy because I haven't understood God's ability. My, my opinion of God's just way too little. That box is way too small. Here, here's, here's the thing, though. When, when God chooses to do something about it, he usually doesn't do it in the way that we want him to do it or the time when we want him to do it. Would you agree? past week, um, I've had the chance to go to the hospital to do some visits with people that were having surgery, recovering from surgery, uh, those kind of things. A lot of times when I go to the hospital, uh, if I have time, and sometimes, a lot of the time, especially this time of the year, I'll make time. Uh, after I make my visit, I'll stop by the maternity ward. The clergy badge gets you into places you can't get in other, <laughs> other time. But I'll just go, and I, I just need to take a minute, and I'll just stand at the window. You ever done that? You stand at the window and you look at all those babies wrapped like burritos in those bassinets, you know. (laughs) By the way, as a dad, I never figured out how to, but moms and nurses evidently have some kind of special class where they can wrap a baby like this burrito. I think that's the Hebrew definition of swaddling clothes, wrapped like a burrito, is is this baby laying there. But I I just watch, and what what, what I'm amazed at is how beautiful they are, but how helpless they are. That baby laying there is totally dependent on somebody else to put clothes on them and wrap them in a blanket to keep them warm. That baby lying there is is totally dependent on on mom to give him or her food, whether mom nurses or or gives them formula. Totally dependent on somebody else. By the way, I've also been known, if there are no babies in the window, to walk into the room of a perfect stranger with my clergy badge on. Hey, I'm a pastor. I'm just one of the local pastors, and I just want to come and celebrate the birth of your baby with you. Would it be okay if I said a prayer for you and your family and your baby? Would it be okay if I held your baby while I pray? <laughs> yeah. No one has ever told me no. When you offer the things of Jesus, a lot of times people won't tell you no. That's a whole other sermon. But, you stand there and you, and you pray and, and you see this baby that's totally helpless and they need somebody to do something about it. Can you imagine the shepherds that day go into Bethlehem and see there'll be a baby there wrapped like a burrito lying in a manger. And they went in and it was just as they had been told. And you know one of the things I think they had to think? Good grief. We've got another 20 to 30 years to wait for Messiah. Even if he is the one, he can't be a political deliverer right now. He's a baby. He can't be a military victor right now. He's a child. We've got another 20 to 30 years to wait. But do you trust in the one who can do something about it? And then it says he's Lord. He's Lord. Philippians chapter 2, verse 11. There come a day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord means this, we can rejoice in the birth of Jesus when we make Jesus our greatest love. See, here's the struggle, I think. If we're not careful, Jesus just becomes another story like Santa and Rudolph and Frosty. And if we're not careful, Jesus just becomes another love that's equal to or lesser than the other loves of our life. And part of it's a language issue with us, right? Well, I love Jesus, but I love the Bengals. I love Jesus, but I love Mexican food. 
And we're not careful, Jesus just, whether it's intentional or unintentional, Jesus just gets put on a, a level that's equal with the other loves of our life. And, and usually it's not just equal, but some, sometimes he's lesser than the other loves of our life. And if he's not the greatest love of our life, the scripture says there will come a time when you will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Lord, the King, the second coming. Everybody will acknowledge it, but the challenge is not to do it before it's too late. And so we can rejoice when we understand this, that he's our Savior who forgives our past, that he's our, Marso her, he's our Messiah who will do something about it in the present, and he is the Lord who directs our future. And if we'll grab a hold of that kind of relationship, internal and eternal relationship with God, amazing things will happen. Well, if you're not experiencing joy this season, let me share with you one of five possible reasons why you're not. There are probably others, but these are the five ones that I see that kind of on a regular basis. One of five reasons that you're not experiencing joy. And the first one is unbelief. Around here we say it this way. We believe he is God, he is good, and I will trust him. I will trust him means he has a plan and a purpose for my life. So I just want to ask, if you're not experiencing joy, is there unbelief going on in your life where you, you don't believe he's God? You don't believe he's good. You don't believe he's Savior. You don't believe he's Messiah. You don't believe he's Lord. You don't believe he's good. Or is there a place in your life where you just said, I, I won't trust him there? If any one of those three things is true, if there's unbelief in any one of those areas, it's going to rob you. It's going to steal joy right out from underneath you. Unbelief. The second one where I want to spend the majority of our time this morning right now is, is trials, tests tribulations. I, I put on your teaching outline Romans chapter th uh, 5 verses 3 uh, through 5. I want to explain this process to you because sometimes we go through trials and sometimes we want God to do something about it and it is a trial and God's not doing what we want him to do when we want him to do it the way we thought he should do it. But look what trials do. Look what God's word says. Ephesians 5, I mean Romans 5 verses 3 through 5. If you're following along on your teaching outline or in a Bible I'm going to ask you to mark it up this verse up a little bit. We rejoice in, circle the word in, not because of or in spite of, but in. As I'm going into this trial, as I'm going into it, whatever it might be, I'm going to rejoice in it. We, excuse me, we rejoice in our sufferings. The word suffering is distress. It's, it's disaster. It's what David used in Psalm 51. God, the, I'm going to trust in you till, till this disaster is past. Man, life's dark. It's hidden. I don't see it work. God uh, it says we rejoice in our, our distress or our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces, circle, underline, highlight that word, suffering, your trial, your distress, your disaster, it's God wants to use it to produce something in your life. What's he want to produce? It says produces endurance. Some of your translations read perseverance. Um, uh, on your teaching outline it says uh, perseverance, but write endurance, perseverance, and that simply means the ability to handle pressure. The ability to handle pressure. God says to you, you're going through this trial, and one of the things this is going to produce in you is the ability to handle pressure. Because once you get through this it, guess what? There's another it down here. And then there's another it down the road. And the next time you come face to face with an it, you're already going to have the ability to handle pressure. And this ability to handle pressure, this endurance, this perseverance, it says, uh, is going to produce character. The word used there for character appears only six times in all of the scriptures. And it means this, proven reliable. Proven reliable. God says, I'm going I'm to take you through it, and I'm going to be the, be the Messiah who delivers you out of it, but it's going to produce in you the ability to handle pressure, and when you've handled that pressure, you're going to be proven reliable for me and my kingdom. Amazing what a trial can do. And then it says, uh, the, the, the ability to handle pressure produces uh, the ability to be proven reliable character, and that character then produces hope. And hope is the absolute confidence in divine activity. That's the definition of hope. Absolute confidence in divine activity. I don't know when, I don't know how, but I, I, I can just have hope that God's going to act because that's who he is. He's Savior, he's Messiah, he's Lord. And I have this internal, eternal relationship with him and I, I just don't doubt these things. It's been said by more than one person, you can live 40 days without food, three days without water, eight minutes without air, but not one second without hope. And oftentimes that hope is produced through trials. Don't let trials rob you of joy. Third thing that I see rob people of joy all the time is guilt. Guilt. You feel like you've messed up. You feel like you've made mistakes. You feel like you're too bad. You're terrible. You're awful. You're no good. You're very bad. And you just have all of this guilt. I just want you to know guilt does not come from God. Conviction comes from God that he wants to change us, but guilt's not from him. God wants to wipe that guilt away. He's your savior to forgive your past. Guilt. The next thing I see that robs people of, of joy are grudges. 
By the way, next to grudges, you might want to jot down Romans chapter 12, verse 19, which the Cox paraphrase of that is, uh, let God deal with your grudges. That's his business, not yours. Who is it that's hurt you? Who is it that's caused you pain? Who is it that's just, um, just destroyed you? You can either hold a grudge against them, but here's the way grudges work, right? When somebody does something against me and I've got a grudge with them, I say I want to get even, but I really don't want to get even, do I? I want to get ahead. Because if you've hurt me this much, then I want to hurt you this much. And when I hurt you this much, you want to hurt me this much. It's, by, by the way, has it ever, maybe it's just me because I don't, like words and phrases. What's, what's the phrase? What do we do to a grudge? Any, anybody remember the word? We, we nurse grudges. Anybody ever heard that phrase, that we nurse grudges? You ever watched a nursing baby? They do not want to let go. That's, if you do that to a grudge, friends, it's just going to destroy you. It's going to rob you of joy. And the next thing is pride. Pride just robs me of joy. Pride robs me of joy when I say, hey, I'm not in the grips of sin. I can just try harder and God will, God will recognize my goodness. No, he won't. I don't need him as Savior. Pride says I don't need him as Messiah to do something about it because I'm really not, I'm really not uh, helpless. I, 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 can, I can figure this out. And, and pride says uh, I don't need him as my Lord to direct my future because I, I've got a plan and a purpose for my life that doesn't involve God. And pride just robs us from joy. So how do I practice joy? Psalm 118, 24. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I love the, today's New International Translation of that. It says, God has done it even today. So I will rejoice and be glad in today. It's a choice to rejoice. How, how do I put joy in its proper perspective? You know the acrostic. You've probably heard it all of your life. And so it's nothing new, but I want to share it with you again. J stands for Jesus first. Jesus first. If I want to experience and practice joy all of my life, I put Jesus first. I put him first as my Savior to forgive my past. I put him first as my Messiah to, to, to deal with my present. I put him first as my Lord to direct my future. I develop this internal and eternal relationship with him. He, he's not just an equal to or lesser than love of all the other loves of my life. He's the greatest love of my life. And I spend time with him and I get to know him and I, and I love him and he loves me back. I, I put Jesus first. The O stands for others second. The scriptures say Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If I want to have the kind of life that I want, a life filled with joy, it starts with Jesus first, I know God, and it starts with others second, I serve God. On your outline, I put live to give, live to give. I'm going to live my life. Jesus did not come to serve, but to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. There are all kinds of service opportunities out there. Pastor Bicknell mentioned one to the Fiston Park Parish just a, just a little bit ago before I began to teach. Hey, we just need people to be willing to show up and, and uh, snow blow the walks and sweep the, sweep the porches and sweep the ramp. Man, that's a great service opportunity. Well, that's service? Absolutely. Earlier today, I, I had somebody just come up to me uh, before I was getting ready to teach in the, in the 9 o'clock gathering and say, hey, Tim, can I have your car keys? It's really not the time to ask me for my car keys as I'm getting ready to preach. I'm like, why well, is my dad leave my lights on or something? Said, said no. Said, I, I know you've got to leave as soon as you're done at 9 and get over across town to preach the 10 o'clock at, at Jane Chance Elementary School. And it's cold out today. I just thought I'd go out and warm up your car for you before you got in it. That's service. Always putting somebody else and their needs ahead. All kinds of service opportunities. We have uh, the ability to serve others as we show and share the love of Christ. And you guys have done an amazing job showing and sharing the love of Christ. Over 60 families, 60 students that will be getting Christmas gifts this, this Christmas just because you wanted to show the love of Christ. You're serving. You serve on Sundays. You serve through the week. You serve in amazing places inside the church and outside the church. But you're serving Serving others, putting others second. This, this Christmas season, we'll also have a chance to, to, to serve by giving. Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give. And so this Christmas, we'll be taking our, our annual Christmas offering. And we use this Christmas offering at the end of every year to, to, to fund ministry for the next year. This year, we've set a goal of $50,000. Well, how in the world are we going to reach $50,000? It's if every one of us will answer this one question. What would God have me give to this end of the year offering? Here's the way we've asked you to look at it the last couple of years. 
Maybe you want to make the biggest Christmas gift you give this year a gift to the ministry of Miami Valley Community Church. And if it comes in in this offering or you go online and you give online and you select the Christmas offering fund, I guarantee you every penny of it that you give will be given to meet a practical need to show the love of Christ. It won't go to my salary or any other staff member's salary. It won't go to pay a light bill. It won't go to pay insurance. It won't go to pay any of that. It will go strictly, directly into ministry. 100 pennies of every dollar that's given to this offering will go to meet the need of somebody who needs to see and to hear the love of Jesus. Over the past couple of years, we've had people tell us, hey, we did that, we prayed, and, and you know, the big, most expensive gift I gave this year was $100, and so I gave a $125 gift to the church. That was the biggest gift I gave this year. We've had some people over the last couple of years say, we didn't do it that way. What we did was we totaled up everything that we spent on Christmas gifts, and if it equaled $500, we gave, six, we, we gave more than we gave in all of the gifts that we gave. By the way, if you do not know the total amount of money you're spending on Christmas gifts this year. We're offering a thing in January called Financial Peace University. <laughs> that better be a budget item in your budget. If it's not, it means your finances are out of control and you need to bring them under control and you're one decision away from stupid. I'm just, I, just, I just want to tell you. And we need to follow through on how we budget our money. But, I mean, that was an extra sermon just for free today. So there, <laughs> there you go. So, uh, Jesus first, others second. Around here, when it comes to showing and sharing the love of God, we call it I-4. I'm going to be talking more about this tonight at 6 o'clock. Intercede. I love Romans chapter 10, verse 1 there on your teaching outline. I, how I wish with all of my heart that my own people might be saved, how I pray to God for them. The simplest way to begin sharing Christ with somebody else is to pray for them, getting on your knees in front of them. Intercede. Invest. How do I invest in somebody's life? How do I build a relationship? Number three is Invite. How do I invite them? We're going to talk, be talking more about this tonight because some of you are going to invite somebody to Christmas Eve and some of those people that come on Christmas Eve, they're going to ask Jesus to be their Savior and that's a great thing. But some of you are going to invite somebody on Christmas Eve and they're going to walk away and say, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard or saw. I don't know why anybody believes in Jesus. And you're like, well, that, that just doesn't work. If I invite them, it doesn't work. Well, it might not work, but we're not ask, asking you just to stop at inviting. The next step is to get involved in their life. How do I get involved in their life? How do I continue to have that spiritual conversation? Because chances are, if you invite them and they don't say yes to Jesus in a church service, God's going to want you to continue to be involved in that relationship with them, to continue to show and share the love of God. We'll talk more about that at 6 o'clock tonight. Intercede, invest, invite, and involve. Jesus first, others second, you last. But we see what I put on your teaching outline, please? You last, but not least. Every October, about Halloween, I start... Spending time with God, say, hey, God, what do you want to do in my life the next year? What, where do I need to grow? What are the truths that I need to understand? Not to teach on, but God, just for my personal walk with you, my personal relationship with you. And, and I begin to dig through that. And my goal is to always have that question answered by Thanksgiving. And so, so this year, about November 5th, if I look at my journal this morning again, it, it, about November 5th, God began to speak into my heart. Hey, Tim, this is where I want you to spend time. And I'm not going to tell you what exactly, but, but, but he said, I, I want you to go to, I want you to spend time in the book of Zephaniah. I'm like, seriously? Old Testament minor prophet, really? God, I could give you the definition. I could give you a working outline of Zephaniah. I know the material that's in there, and I could tell you that Zephaniah, you kind of outline it by the number of times that he says, uh, on that day, on that day, and he's prophesying destruction and death and gloom and doom. I'm like, God, that's really not where I want to spend my time. God just kept saying, Zephaniah, Zephaniah, Zephaniah. So I've been reading Zephaniah like crazy over the last several weeks, and there's a verse in Zephaniah that I just can't escape. And I still don't know what it all means. And I've done the preacher work. I've done the Hebrew study. I've done the, the book study. I've done the, the devotional study. And I'm still wrestling with it. I put it for you on your teaching outline. Remember the point is, Jesus first, others second, you last but not least. Because I believe with all of my heart, in the next 60 seconds, this is what somebody that's listening right now needs to hear. And you haven't heard anything else, but you need to hear this. Zephaniah 3.17 says this, The Lord your God is with you. Sound vaguely familiar? Christmas presents. He's the mighty warrior who saves. He's the savior. He's the Messiah. He's the one who can do something about it. He's, he's the Lord. He will take great delight in you. And sometimes I miss out on joy because I don't believe that to be true about my life. How in the world could God take delight in me? I know who I am. And I know the sin that I struggle with. And I know the anger. And I know my ability to nurse a grudge like nobody else can nurse a grudge. How can God take delight in me? And I'm wrestling with it, friends, but this is the verse that God just keeps speaking into my spirit that I need to grow. It says this, in his love, he will no longer rebuke you. And I love that. 
Because he's my savior, he'll forgive my past. He's my Messiah, he'll do something about it. He'll change my personality, he'll change my character. He'll, he'll, he'll give me the ability to handle pressure. He'll, he'll give me the ability to be proven reliable. He'll, he'll no longer rebuke me. But then this, fa- then this section of it, but he will rejoice over you with singing. Now God, I don't know what that means. God, show me what that means. God, teach me what that means. Didn't get anything as I studied the Hebrew. Didn't get anything as I looked at the context. You know, didn't get anything. God, show me what that means. God, show me what that means. God, show me what that means. God, how can you take delight in me? How can you rejoice over me with singing? And one morning in my study, as I'm just reading Zephaniah, and I'm just hitting this brick wall, God, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. God, show me what that means. It was as if I heard God singing. I didn't hear an audible voice. I don't want you to think those kind of things, but... It's as if I heard God singing. And this is what I heard him singing. Forgive me for being off pitch. I love Tim. This I know. And my father told him so. That little one belongs to me. He is weak, but I am strong. Yes, I love Tim. Yes. I love Tim. Yes, I love Tim. My Bible tells him so. I started to weep in my study at the house, thinking that my heavenly dad, Jesus, his son, would sing over me a childlike song that I need to hear every single day of my life. I love Tim. I love Tim. I love Tim. And if you have not let the love of God capture you, you cannot experience his joy. If you have not let his love as Savior to forgive your past, his love as Messiah to do something about it, and his love as Lord to direct your future, if you haven't grabbed a hold of that love, my friend, you don't need anything else to grab a hold of joy but to hear God singing over you. Let me ask you, what song do you need to hear God singing over you today? He will rejoice His choice to rejoice over you. What do you need to hear him? I've got a hunch. It's got to be some childlike song that says he loves you, he forgives you, he cares about you. I don't know what song do you need to hear him sing. Heavenly Dad, right now I pray as only you can do through the power of your spirit that each and every one listening right now would hear you choosing to rejoice over them. telling them that you will no longer hold their past against them because you sent Jesus as Savior, telling them that you will do something about it right now because you sent Jesus to be the Messiah, to be the one who can do what we are not able to do ourselves, and that you will direct their future because you sent Jesus as Lord to give us direction and purpose. God, you rejoice over us with forgiveness for our past, your presence for this moment, and your direction for our future. God, may we hear you singing over us. And then God, I don't know what truth beyond that that someone needs to hear right now. It may be the simplicity of your love. That you love them. That you care about them. God, Thank you for choosing to rejoice over us with singing. May we hear your song over our lives. And God, if we're missing out on that, may we dig just a little bit deeper. May Jesus not be equal to or lesser than any of the other loves of our life, but may he become the greatest love of our life. May our internal and eternal relationship with you be more important than our external circumstances. And God, do what you promised to do. Take this trial, this suffering, this stress, this disaster, and use it to give us the ability to handle pressure. Pressure. God, use it so that we might be proven reliable. 
God, use it so that we might have hope in your divine activity as Savior, as Messiah, as Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Here are the questions, or my prayer for you, the last two blanks on your teaching outline, I didn't get to, last two blanks. Uh, I'm praying that uh, you will uh, choose joy, and I'm praying that you will practice joy this Advent season. Both of those things are up to you, that you'll choose it, and that you'll practice it, that you'll spread it, that you'll share it. Two questions as we end, and I'd like for you to fill out the commitment cards. I'd like for those of you watching online to send us electronic response. What did you hear God say? What do you need to do to obey? How can we help you? How can we pray with you? God loves you. Would you stand with me for a word of blessing, benediction? Heavenly Dad, you rejoice over us with song. You sent Jesus to be our Savior, to be our Messiah, to be our Lord. And God, I pray right now that each and, one, each and everyone listening, whether in one of our local venues or someplace around the world, God, that they would know your joy this day and that they would take it and that they would share it. God, may you be glorified in our life and may we hear your voice of singing over us. Now, brothers and sisters, as you leave a church building, a school building, a house, a dorm room, God, wherever my friends are, I pray over them your blessing and your protection. God, cover them with your peace, cover them with your hope. God, may they choose your joy this day and every day that they live. God, this is the day you've made. We will rejoice and be glad in it and we'll share your love with somebody else. God, may your peace and your presence and your wholeness rest on each one who hears. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.